and Britain were in agreement. By hindsight, we can see the web of conspiracy against the Arabs of Palestine. Indeed, the Americans endorsed the Balfour Declaration. The British were going to implement it. But behind both were Jewish and Christian Zionists, active, each working for its own from its own perspective and for its own objective to provide the political and theological underpinnings. When I reflect on this, I believe it was the beginning of the Nakba, the catastrophe, not only the political, but equally the theological and the moral Nakba. It all started in the minds and hearts of seemingly good people who honestly believed that they were doing God's will. But from the perspective of, the, of its victims, it was a stark colonial project that dealt a deadly blow to the indigenous people of Palestine, who had no say. They were invisible. Their destiny was being decided by the people of power. Again, powers, the powers trumped justice. During this period, a new type of Christian Zionism also was created. Again, very briefly, just to mention a person that many of you have heard about, Reinhold Niebuhr, the eminent theologian. He was raised, reared, and in a conservative theological tradition and was a zealous Zionist. He was not a Christian restorationist. In fact, he was contemptuous of Christianity. Nowhere in Niebuhr's writings is there any talk of God's purposes with regard to the restoration of Jews. Niebuhr had no sympathy for biblical literalism. I believe Niebuhr has come to, pre to, re to represent a new type of Christian Zionist who's not biblical literalist, but they are very much pro-Zionist. During this period also, the tragic events of the Holocaust took place, and the Holocaust undoubtedly contributed much in increased sympathy for Jews after the, after the Second World War and for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. The third stage, again very briefly. 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel to 1967 war. This period is characterized by, by a great euphoria for the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. For Christian Zionists, and according to their interpretation, it was exhilarating to see the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy of chapter 37, in the gathering of Jews from the four corners of the earth. Indeed, Christian Zionists were disappointed to see an Israel which is secular, unwilling to acknowledge a divine hand in the establishment of Israel. Because Israel, when it was established in 1948, the leaders were all Zionist, secular Zionists. The rationale in those days for the establishment of the State of Israel because of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. There has to be a, Jew, a, a Jewish state. But for the Christian Zionists, as far as they were concerned, the end times had already begun. And during this period, between 1948 and 1967, Israel was building its military power. And the, Zionist, the secular Zionists were in government. The fourth stage in the development of Christian Zionism 
one can refer to 1967 war to the present to the present time. The 1967 war changed the political map of the area and the nature of Zionism itself. As far as the Christian Zionists was concerned, the occupation of East Jerusalem, especially the Haram area, that what Jews would call the Temple Mount by Israel, marked a further sign of the approaching end. Now, Christian Zionists started looking for the rebuild of the Third Temple to, in, to usher in the Second Coming of Christ. During this stage, the rationale changed. I mentioned the rationale under secular Zionism was anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Now, under, under religious Zionism, the rationale became God gave us the land. It's not the Holocaust. It's not anti-Semitism. It is God. It is the Bible. The Bible says it. A number of American Christian Zionists became actively involved during this period. Many of you have heard of Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and others like him. More recently, John Hagee topped the list in his involvement and commitment for Israel. Some of these people were very influential. Just one anecdote about Jerry Falwell. When he detected that President Bush called on Israel to withdraw its tanks from Palestinian towns on the West Bank, Falwell shut off a letter to protest of protest to the White House, which was followed by 100,000 emails from Christian leaders. Israel did not move its tanks and Mr. Did not ask again. That was the power of the Christian Zionists. The American Christian Zionists have their in Britain and in other places. In the words of Walter Riggins, the general director of Church Mission to Jews, Christian Zionists generally agree on three cardinal beliefs, allowing for a wide diversity of views as to their theological significance. Let me mention them to you. First, the return of Jews to the land and the establishment of the State of Israel should be interpreted as a fulfillment of Old Testament promises and prophecies in the land as signs of God's continuing mercy and faithfulness to the Jewish people. Second, the establishment of the State of Israel has a special theological significance because of what it means for the Jews and what it means to the turning of the Jews, Jewish people, to their Messiah and the second coming of Christ. And thirdly, Christians should not only support the idea of a Jewish state, they need to support policies as a sign of God's mercy and faithfulness. Can you believe this? That you have to support the policies of the state. Christian Zionism base these beliefs on several theological principles. The Bible is the literal and inerrant word of God. God's covenant with Israel is eternal and exclusive. Prophecy is the key to understanding and apocalyptic events. The end times and Armageddon are imminent. Someone might ask, what prompts a pro-Israel stance for evangelicals. I believe that conservative and literal biblical interpretation, especially of the Old Testament, 
is one of the things that prompts them. The end time role, which many of them believe about the second coming of Christ. Some of them are prompted by the Holocaust guilt, others by Islamophobia. In September 19, 2011, David Goshi and Glenn Stassen wrote an open letter to America's Christian Zionist. 50 students came from Fuller Seminary to Jerusalem. I met with the group. I knew Stassen before. Unfortunately, I think he passed away a few, few years ago. Great guy. They came to prepare letter they wanted to send to the Christian Zionist. I wish I could go into this time, but I'd like to commend it to you. You can find it, open letter to America's Christian by David Gushy and Glenn Stassen, September 19, 2011. It's an amazing letter, directly talking to Christian Zionism in their own language. What is our critique of Christian Zionism? Few, just to mention few. Theologically, Christian Zionism is a Christian aberration. I would even say more than that, Christian heresy. Because it corrupts the biblical message of love, justice, and peace. Christian Zionists are guilty of emphasizing an end of the world theology of violence that contradicts the heart of the gospel of love and mercy. The exclusive biblical text about God's promise of the land reflect a tribal understanding that had been surpassed and transcended even within the Old Testament itself. Christian Zionist belief in, a, in Jewish racial exclusivity and their divine right to inherit and control all the land of Palestine contradicts the inclusive message of the Bible in both Old and Testament. And this is one of the, of the critiques which Jewish people articulate. Finally, let me give you some signs of hope. 2010, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life conducted a major survey of evangelical leaders attending the third Luzon of world evangelization in Cape Town, South Africa. The survey showed that only a minority of evangelicals worldwide sympathized primarily with Israel. <clears throat> Amazing. And that American evangelical leaders were actually less inclined to support Israel than evangelical leaders in general. <clears throat> One of the main reasons for those statistics was attributed to the production of no less than three major documentaries in 2010 that challenged Christian support for Israel. Waiting for Armageddon. Some of you probably have seen all these documentaries. Waiting for Armageddon was produced by a team of secular people. But then, with God on our side, you remember that? With God on our side and little town of Bethlehem were made by Christians specifically for Christians. With God on Our Side was produced by a former youth with a mission, the YWAM. While Little Bethlehem was funded and produced, listen to this, by Mark Green, chairman of the board of trustees of Oral Roberts University and heir to the Hobby Lobby Arts and Crafts Stores Fortune. In 2013, another anti-Zionist, anti-Israel documentary, The Stones Cry Out, came out. 
Sabil was a major sponsor of this document, documentary. And we now, we put subtitles in different languages for this documentary, and it's being shown in so many different places. This is very important. So it makes a difference when you really act. On 11th of March, 2014, Eliakim Cohen posted a very interesting article, The End of Evangelical Support for Israel. The millennial, he says, the millennial generation of young believers, roughly ages 18, are rebelling against what they perceive as the excessive biblical literalism and politicism of their parents. <laughs> as they strive with a renewed vigor to imitate Jesus' stand with the oppressed and they want to decide for themselves which party is being oppressed in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because many people think it is Israel that is oppressed. This is the way propaganda works. In January 2015, Ryan Byler published an article, The Decline of Christian Zionism. He mentioned that Christian United for Israel, KUFI, the largest Zionist Christian organization in the United States, headed by John Hagee of San Antonio, Texas, recently celebrated the milestone of two million members, according to Robert Brogue, its executive director. But he admitted, Brog admitted, that there is growing movement of Christians expressing solidarity with Palestine and promoting BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. With a clear call for justice and freedom for the Palestinians and peace and security for Israel. So we are not denying the existence or, uh, of Israel. We want Israel to be secure, but we are saying justice and freedom for the Palestinians. Brog admits that younger Christians show less support for, for Israel than their parents. They want to advocate for equal rights of the Palestinians instead of a literalist interpretation of the Bible that privilege tribal identities. Byler ends his article by saying, Kufi represents the last desperate gasp of an outmoded worldview. Its supporters are well-known neocons that pushed the U.S. to invade Iraq and now have their bomb sites set on Iran. One can only hope that these younger evangelical Christians can become more actively involved in support, in supporting for the Palestinians. Finally, what can we do, my friends? To begin with, I'd like to say, whenever possible, we need to reach out to our Christian Christian Zionist with love and care. And we need to encourage them to come and see for themselves what's happening back home. Because many of them come, but they never come to the West Bank. They never see what's really happening. But for us, Bible readers, Bible readings from the common lectionary, or outside the common lectionary that reflect racist attitudes, exclusive and tribal theology, it, my friends, must be avoided unless it is preached on and challenged. I go to churches, I see this. I cannot, sometimes I cannot bear to listen to the reading of the Bible. Or mainline churches. We need to challenge those exclusive texts. We need to learn how to use the Old Testament as Jesus used it. Father Richard Rohr 
contemplation and action road. Jesus never quoted from the book of Numbers, which is rather ritualistic and legalistic. Jesus never quoted Joshua or Judges, which are full of sanctified violence. Jesus did not quote biblical texts that are punitive, imperialistic, or ex exclusionary. In fact, he taught the exact opposite in every case. When studying the Bible, it is important to remember the words of Paul, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. We need to conform to the spirit of Christ in reading the scriptures. It is, it is the words, the exclusive words, the exclusive text, literally taken, that bring misery and pain to us. These are, these are the texts that are being used by the settlers against the Palestinians. The use of a hermeneutic of love can help us avoid many of those problems. Another point, please help your church to become involved in the Palestine-Israel issue. The best way to begin, as many of you know, is to bring them to, to visit, to discover for themselves the reality on the ground, so that they can see and become advocate for justice and peace. It is important also for our church leaders to be involved. Most of our problems is because we have bishops and patriarchs and archbishops who dare not speak, who don't speak. They must speak prophetically. We need to encourage them. We need to challenge them. We need to stand up for the human political and political rights of the Palestinians. We need to work against any form of discrimination and racism. We need to be against anti-Semitism, against Islamophobia, and anything else that dehumanizes people. We need to insist that peace in Palestine and Israel must be based on the principles of international law. We need to resist the Israeli occupation through nonviolent methods and means. Nonviolence, my friends, is the most radical challenge to oppression and injustice that Christians have at their disposal. Nonviolence threatens the oppressors and undermines the violence of the powerful. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions are legitimate nonviolent ways to be used in order to pressure Israel to stop its injustice. We must not never give up. We must not despair. We must continue working for peace. Let us remember the words of Thomas Merton. Peace demands the most heroic labor, the most difficult sacrifice. It demands greater fidelity to the truth and a much more perfect purity on conscience. To this, I invite you, my brothers and sisters. This is the challenge for all of us. We will continue to work for the establishment of peace for all the people of Palestine and Israel. Thank you.
I'd like to invite the Reverend Jay Olson to offer an initial response uh, to Naeem's comments in light of um, his historical analysis at the beginning of his uh, speech. I imagine she's quite glad tonight she's not an Anglican. She is, in fact, an ordained minister of the United Church of Canada. She served congregations in BC, in Alaska, and Southern California. She served as a Presbyter presbytery executive of the Presbyterian Church USA in Alaska, California, and Nevada. She is currently serving as an interim minister in Burnaby and is very proud of the fact that she was adopted in Alaska by the Kitskadi clan of the Tlingit people in Sitka. So I invite Jay to come forward. to our elder leader, Mary Charles, to our distinguished panelists, our brother, and uh, to all of you who I see today as my neighbors. I am overwhelmed, particularly overwhelmed, and privileged at the invitation uh, to respond um, to this passionate word to us and to do so uh, in some respects on your behalf, beginning by thanking our brother Naeem Atik for being here and for speaking truth to us in a way that unless, uh, unless we are not truly present, we, it, it's just not possible to he not hear what you have had to say to us. So thank you for that. When I was asked to be the respondent, my first response was, really, why me? I can think off the top of my head of at least a dozen people who, would, uh, who are far more knowledgeable than am I on this matter, far more experienced, and certainly far more articulate. Uh, and then I contemplated this invitation and I thought, this is my chance in some small way uh, to embody and reflect the transformation that I have experienced by brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. So I'm not speaking as any expert, and I'm certainly not speaking out of any wisdom, but I stand here in the privilege of being able to say that um, part of this journey that, was, uh, that I've been led on by Palestinian sisters and brothers and those in both Canada and the United States um, are instruments of my own redemption and salvation. That I've been transformed by the likes of, and Brother Naeem knows some of these people. When I served in the Presbyterian Church USA, became colleagues and friends with the Reverend Dr. Fahed Abu Akel, who was elected a Palestinian uh, moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA at a time when nobody thought that was possible. Had the good fortune of being led and taught by other staff of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, um, Dr. Mary and Douglas Dix, regional representatives in the region, who have done exactly as our brother has called us to do, and borne witness and spoken the truth uh, at oftentimes great cost to themselves. And then the transformation that I continue to undergo after having experienced and heard from the Reverend Dr. Mitri Raheb, who is the uh, pastor of the Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem and the extraordinary work of the International Center there in Bethlehem, and particularly with the Stars of Bethlehem, the work with children uh, across cultures and religious perspectives. These people have helped me to see that my call as a person of faith and as a human being is to do what I think I heard <clears throat> in, this, um, in this direction for us tonight, 
which is to embody Christ's just peace. Perhaps like you, though some of you are far more knowledgeable than am I, I sat there, I mean, you should see my notes, writing and scribbling, filling in all the gaps of the history and the pieces that I can't recall just like that. And the more I scribbled and the more I worked and the more I heard and the more the passion rose in you, I realized the task isn't um, a systematic knowledge and understanding. But that's only as important as the learning and the transformation that I embody after hearing and witnessing to that. I, was, I had the good fortune of being able to be in the region in about 2009. I went with a very small group of people from Muckleteal, Washington, um, to visit in the region uh, and to visit at Sibyl and share a communion meal with you to visit at Bet Salem, to visit in the International Center, and to meet shopkeepers, uh, which was frankly probably the most transformative for me to meet shopkeepers and sit and listen to uh, what life was like on a day-to-day -day basis as people raised their children, particularly Palestinian Christian children in the region, and how transformative that's been for me. These people, not the experience, People changed my life as a human being and as a person of faith. And as I listen to this conversation tonight, it's all the big circles in my notes that I made have to do with what does it mean to be, for me as a Christian, to be that full human being as witness to and called upon and worked towards um, that I see uh, in my experience of Jesus of Nazareth and even for me in the risen Christ. What does it mean for to, to embody this truth that in fact justice does trump prophecy? What does it mean to embody that? What does it mean for me to embody that, to not just raise awareness in my neighbors who are either apathetic and not interested or just uh, profoundly wrong understanding of what's happening in the region and how we as neighbors in North America, and I'm absolutely shocked to say, stunningly so in Canada, since uh, I've realized what's happening here upon my return a few years ago, that in our direct participation, with this propaganda at best and this at worst. mean for us, regardless of how we name our faith or proclaim a belief system, what does it mean for any of us to embody and for our churches to embody that justice does trump prophecy? What does it mean for us particularly those of us who proclaim to be Christian, to do as Brother Atik has suggested to us that we, in fact, by the teachings of the one we follow, in fact, keep awake. What does that look like? What does that look like? My friend in recovery says, what does it look like in tennis shoes? When it's walking down the street, when it's filling out a ballot, when it's talking to political leaders, when it's talking with Sunday school classes, or for me, just talking to my sisters or my mom on a daily basis. What does it mean to embody that? I happen to believe, and I think within our tradition, rightfully so, that it's that daily, ongoing, everyday conversation that helps to bring about the transformation. There is so much more um, I could say about this. Apparently, my, my job is to help formulate a question for you and with you to come back to this. But I think uh, I'm, I'm perhaps right in assuming that you already have well-formed questions of your own. And since hearing um, our brother um, have those for yourselves, but I guess I would encourage us in the next together to contemplate 
what this embodiment of hope looks like to which we are being called. That embodiment of hope that it does, it should, and hopefully does, call us to stand critically within our own traditions. And in fact, for those of us who claim a tradition that has sacred texts, that we in fact uh, become deeply and more profoundly literate in our own texts. What is what doesn't it say? So we, in fact, in those day-to-day -day conversations can say, well, actually, no, it doesn't really mean that. And to practice that has this impact on our friends and neighbors. What does it mean to embody the hope? I think what I take away tonight is that profound reminder that we need to ourselves, as the gospel calls, to come and see to come and see and to, in fact, while in the region, keep our mouths closed and listen with every ounce of our being to what our sisters and brothers are saying um, without indulging uh, in any understanding that somehow we really know what it's like to be there, to live there, to be in our brothers' and sisters' shoes. So what does it mean for us then, in light of what we heard, to embody the stories of justice, embody this call that's come to us tonight uh, through this detailed and profound presentation? When I heard you speak of hope, you spoke of the documentaries. It should be no surprise to us, for any of us in any of our traditions, the transformation, truth, for some of us we would call salvation, comes through the telling and the retelling and the hearing changing and the telling again of the stories of faith. Who are the people that are transformative within those? What does it mean for us, what does it mean for me in my return to reach out, in fact, to Christian Zionists around me with love and care, when in truth I'd just rather avoid all of that because it's uncomfortable and it's annoying. At the same time, I remember standing on the street, standing on the streets, whether it be in Jerusalem or Bethlehem or Nazareth or other places, and all, I didn't have to ask anything, I didn't say anything, all I had to do was look around and it's painfully and abundantly clear what is happening to a particular group of people in that region, a people um, who should know this and have the same privileges of home as anybody else would expect. So I don't have your question for you except to say I'm going to uh, move into our next phase together thinking about what does it mean for us, for people of faith, for individuals, for families, for churches, to embody this just peace uh, to which we've been called. What does it mean to embody it as people of faith with the hope that's been given to us by the one greater and bigger than we are. I think what is true is, with every day I ask that question, the answer transforms and changes yet again. Came into this event tonight, so much of the conversations that I've had with folks and the learnings that I've had and the transformation undergoing in the last number of years, and I think, has there been any progress at all? I'm certainly I'm not the only one wondering that. Certainly I'm not the only one despairing of that. And yet comes again, it comes again, the call to embody this hope by learning truth, by promoting justice, and not allowing this very skewed understanding of prophecy to trump just that. Thank you for the challenge, 
And thank you for overwhelming me and us with that challenge. And, and may we take at least one next right step in that direction. As I, would, as I close, I do need to say to um, the Anglicans in the group, I do appreciate your, um, your introduction. I think now is the time for true confessions for me also. Um, bishop Mark McDonald, when Mark was bishop in Alaska, made me um, an honorary Episcopalian. <laughs> So I believe I stand in company, and I certainly do as one part of a tradition that has had far too much influence in promoting falsehood, the truth, and the hope that comes from that truth. So would you consider that with me? What does it mean now, here, to embody this hope, this truth, this just peace to which Jesus calls us. Thank you very much, Jay. We have an opportunity now to uh, engage in conversation with each other and then with Naeem uh, about the presentation tonight and Jay's questions for Just reflection. First, we're going to have a short musical interlude in order to settle our minds and our hearts. And then I'm going to ask you to, where you're sitting in the church, form groups of four. And uh, first of all, introduce yourselves to each other very briefly. And then uh, discuss your observations and comments and passions as a result of tonight's presentation. Our volunteers will be circulating with small pieces of paper. If your group has a question, a comment, or an observation to make, please write it down. I'll forward, and I'll ask Naeem to respond to them as we are able within the time. We'll have about 20 minutes in small groups. Then we'll come back together to engage with Naeem. But first, a musical interview. Friends, um, we. We've heard a lot, and so before we form our groups, um, we're just going to play a bit of music as an opportunity for you to integrate some of this, think about response to these things, so that when you come together to talk, you're kind of more centered into that. So it's a, it's a well-known song, Peace is Flowing Like a River, Flowing Out into the Desert, Setting All the Captives Free, but we're not going to sing. We're just going to listen.
let's resume our conversation. A number of uh, questions have come forward about Christian Zionism, uh, requests to clarify uh, what uh, they believe. And the first one I'm going to put to Naeem has to do with the word, the promised land. Uh, when we hear of a right to land, the literalist paradigm, how do we counter? It's a, it takes a, it needs a long answer, but uh, um, within the scripture, within the Bible, the promise, the way I would read it, that those promises were given, um, or we, I would see them as being um, part of a time frame, a time situation, in which they were not unique, even within the scriptures itself, um, where it talks about um, the promises of the land, there are other promises which God has given to other people. So they were not promised for, uh, for the Israelites to, to, for, to take the, to the area of Canaan, or the Canaan, um, but there were other promises that were given to a number of other nations around for areas within the land, that area, that region. Um, and, uh, and so they were not unique, but they reflect a tribal situation. So we know it within even our Arab tribal way of thinking and tribal promises that were given. And I think that's the way I would see them. And then I see that in the development of the, the text of the Bible, um, these exclusive texts were challenged within the Old Testament itself. Uh, so, so you could see the development from tribalism or tribalism to an inclusive understanding of the text. It begins with And so I see in terms of, for me as a Christian, I see inclusive, inclusive and even more inclusive when I come to the way Jesus Christ looked at the whole question of the land. And I will try to touch on this maybe in my uh, workshop. Uh, I don't know when it is going to be, but when it does, I will touch on it more, more in details. Second question and related to it, could you please elaborate on how we should handle the difficult Bible passages that seem to support oppression and injustice, etc.? Should we omit them or reinterpret them? I think they need to be reinterpreted. Um, I think we need to emphasize that that's not the, um, the basic message of the Bible. You know, we have, uh, the Bible is a, is a very large book. You can almost prove anything you want if you select your text, you know. And, uh, and that's the way the church has done it throughout history. I really need to emphasize the heart of the Bible. You know, the Bible reflects a God of love, not a God of war, for example. So if you want to make a case about war, you'll find many texts that talk about war. But that's not the main, the heart, or the biblical message of it. So I would say uh, one needs to be aware of all of this. And again, no one needs to be aware of the development in the uh, in, the, in the text, in the writing of the text, you know, that it, it really moves with exclusive understanding to a more inclusive understanding. Anything that is exclusive, I don't think um, I would put much weight on, you know. I read it, I need to interpret it, but it's not authoritative on me. It does not give me an authority. What gives, what's authoritative for me is anything that has to do with the inclusive nature of God, the inclusive, the inclusive text that talk about loving each other, 
Anything that, that has to do with the inclusive theology would be acceptable. Anything with exclusive theology is unacceptable. And I, I, don't, I don't really um, uh, appropriate it or use it in a, in an, uh, in a way that, um, that I will accept um, as text from, coming from God or a message from God to me in that sense. Thank you. You said that the three branches of Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, have all rejected Zionism. <coughs> the question is, which Zionism have they rejected? <laughs> Christian Zionism, Secular Zionism, or Jewish Zionism? Please clarify if possible. Yes, thank you. Um, what I meant here is that when, when Herzl started his Zionism, uh, all the branches of religious Jews rejected it. Rejected it, and they so also saw it as an aberration. They did not accept it at all. That's what, now the reform, um, still, sorry, we still have today uh, orthodox, ultra-orthodox Jews who re still reject Zionism. They don't accept it at all. So, um, reform, reform Judaism kept until the 30s, I think, I think until, if I'm not mistaken, until the 1930s, they did not accept it. And then they started, uh, and now reform Judaism accepts, accepts Zionism. Um, so, uh, but I'm, I'm talking about what I mentioned in my presentation, is that the Zionism that Herzl um, came up with was rejected by religious Jews. Almost all of them. Not all, but almost all. <clears throat> Next question. Uh, there are two questions, uh, but they seem related. Zionism fit into our federal policies with respect to Israel, in both in Canada and in the U.S. And a related question. Is Christian Zionism an issue present in Canadian mainstream churches today? I think to the first part, some of you probably are better um, or more qualified to really answer it than, uh, than I can, because it has to do with your domestic uh, or your national vision here. The second part was on what? Zionism uh, uh, present in mainstream churches in Canada. Again, I don't know about Canada, uh, but I, I know that uh, Christian Zionism still exists within some of, the mainline, some of the mainline churches. I know in the States, maybe I'm more familiar with that. Um, and there have been some of our people at Sabil or Friends of Sabil have written about this. Uh, people like Rosemary Ruther had written about it. Some of our people here uh, who also have written about it. So it exists, you know, and I think it needs to be uh, addressed and challenged. That's Thank you. Moving on. How can churches work to counter widespread Islamophobia and the belief that Palestinians are all terrorists? You know, now, if people are willing to really do it, because you don't have to go to a Muslim country to Muslims. Uh, Muslims are everywhere. They're living here in Canada, uh, in the United States, in Western countries. They're all there. People need to get to know them, you know. And once you, once you become friends with them, you realize that um, uh, you're not dealing with uh, terrorists. You know, you're, you're dealing with human beings. Because we have terrorists in every one of our religions religion, religious uh, denominations. We have, we have uh, people who are, um, um, who are, what do you call it, prejudiced and, uh, and uh, racist in every area of life, you know. But most people are not that way. And I think it's very important to really get to know them. I remember way back, in, I, um, Many years ago, when I first came to Canada, uh, in Toronto, 
I met, I, I went to see some of uh, the Muslim uh, community uh, people there, and some of them told me, some of the sheikh, religious leaders, they said they really wanted to know more, they wanted to be in, in community with, to relate better to the Christians around. And I came back and told my Christian friends in Toronto, I said, please get to know the Muslims. They want to get to know you. They're open for this. Um, and I left it with them. You know, I don't know that, I hope that things have happened that way and people get to know each other much more rather than stereotype the other and then do not get close to them. This is very important. This is, this is something that I hope we can all uh, be engaged in. In the quest for justice promoted by Sabil, how do you include the key Christian calling to forgive? It's not easy. It's not easy. It's always a challenge. But I, th I believe we should never lower the standard. I think reconciliation is uh, what we are asked to 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 a practice. Um, it doesn't, uh, but it is, you know, it's just like um, uh, when looking at the New Testament. Um, there are two ways about forgiveness. There is one that it's need to, it needs to be preceded by repentance. So I like to think that Israel needs to come to a point or the leaders of Israel, the government of Israel, needs to come to a point in which they would say, um, we've, made a, we've, we've done injustice against you. You know, to commit to best that kind of a thing, to, to say it verbally and publicly. But, um, and, that's, and then forgiveness becomes easier once repentance is given. But you know, Jesus also, uh, Jesus challenged us about another forgiveness which comes in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins because we practice forgiveness. You know, and there is a forgiveness that's not dependent on uh, repentance. That you, you repent, you, you forgive because it's the way God deals with us. You know, this way God's... Uh, uh, forgives us all the time. So it's very interesting about forgiveness. Uh, we always want repentance before forgiveness, but and that's good when it when it can be done. But I hope, hopefully, some of us can even forgive even when there is no repentance in there. It's the more difficult repentance. Elias Shakur has told us that if you have to hate Jews in order to love Palestinians, we don't want that kind of help. How can we speak from our hearts and not with judgment and disdain to others who hold different and potent ideas? I think, I think there is a challenge there which I accept and I think it's all of us need to accept it. How can local churches raise awareness of the Canadian government's complicity, re-Israel, prior to the upcoming federal election? I'm not sure if you know this. There's an election later this year. Yeah. I need the question. How can local churches raise awareness of the Canadian government's complicity re-Israel prior to this year's upcoming federal election? Yeah, I, I think... Um, The church has a responsibility. I mean, 
part of, I mentioned, I, ref, I alluded to the fact that one of the problems we have back home is when the church is silent, when the leaders are silent. Um, and it happens everywhere. Fear is probably the largest uh, detrimental factor. I think the churches need to take a stand for what is just. And Canadians need to do that. I hope the people in the United States need to do that as well. You know, if we can just, if we can have people dare have the courage to speak, uh, to speak up prophetically, um, things will be much better. So we have, we have a real problem within our churches. And, um, and here, I think, with, uh, with I, what I understand, the right-wing government, you know, unfortunately, they have been very much pro-Israel uh, and not uh, able really to take a stand against all the injustices that are committed by the Israeli government. So again here, there is something that needs to be uh, lifted up before people. And, you know, sometimes it's the people in the pew that needs the past, their pastors and their clergy um, to, to do this. And so everyone is complicit. All of us are complicit in this, of our silence in this. And we need, we really need to challenge, especially the bishops, the hierarchy of the churches, to really do this. We have a number of more questions, but I think we are out of time, so I'll put this last question to you. How do we who do not live your reality, give voice to these stories when they are not ours? It's a good question. Um, I think everyone can do what she or he can within their own. Um, and we need, we, we need to pass the word to the people around us. Um, it's very important to, to begin to practice BDS boycott, it's easy for people, and that gives an opportunity to, to tell people why you're doing it. So you can go to the store manager and say, why? This is one way of doing it. I think we really need to do that. Practice it, because that's, that's, it, it will change people, and people will become much more aware of what's happening. Many people don't know most, unfortunately, um, the situation in the Middle East and, uh, and the power of propaganda, you know, is, is very strong against the Palestinians. And I think we need you to say the right word, to take the right stand, to express the right, uh, um, the right thing when it comes to what's really happening. And don't forget, please, to, to continue to pray for us. You know, prayer is very important also as well. So all these things combined can, can help. And I believe, like I've mentioned at the end of my presentation, that uh, younger generations of even these fundamentalists are beginning to question. And I think this is one way of, that we can take part in, and try to help people. Just raise the question. It will make people think about what's really happening. Thank you so much. That brings this first evening of our conference to a close. And may I, on your, your behalf, thank Naeem, not only for his presentation tonight, but for his courage and bravery and the living example of his life, which is the embodiment of Christian prophecy. Robert, Robert Asseli has some closing words for us. Then I will ask if we could stand and say the grace together. Uh, just before we, we do that, uh, we'll have some uh, closing, uh, I have some closing comments and uh, announcements, and maybe I can part one of, one of the questions about uh, uh, what the churches can do uh, in an election year. 
uh, I'm delighted to say what the churches uh, have done without fear is this. They've, they've, uh, they've uh, sponsored this, uh, th this conference and uh, uh, invited a number of you to come. And so the question becomes, what can you do when you go out from here? One thing you can do is remember that tomorrow night's uh, session is open. Those of you who are local, invite your friends. It's going to be uh, uh, a dialogue uh, between uh, Rabbi Elisa Weiss from uh, uh, Jewish Voices for Peace in San Francisco and uh, Jonathan Katab, who's here. It will be fascinating. And just a word about, um, <laughs> about uh, Jonathan. This kind of goes to our elections as well. Uh, my son, when he went to uh, Palestine or tried to go a couple of years ago to a Sabil conference, uh, Bashara, who's around um, because he was born in Jerusalem maybe, because his first name and last name are Arabic, we don't know, uh, was detained when he got to the airport. And uh, in what's called, everybody in Palestine knows it as the room. Um, and he, he, he was deta detained and unfortunately uh, uh, put in detention and, uh, and deported. Well, uh, we are delighted that we're going to have tomorrow night's panel with Jonathan. Until tonight, I didn't know that Canada had a room. And Jonathan uh, eventually made it here. He was in the room at Vancouver Airport for three hours. So <laughs> uh, good to have you here, Jonathan. And I don't know why Jonathan was put perhaps it's because I don't know. <laughs> Uh, a few announcements. Those of you who have registered, uh, you still have to sign in and uh, get your packet. There's more of that uh, this evening in, at the reception. For the entirety of the conference, food and drinks are only permitted in the room in which they are served. Okay, uh, there's no food and drinks allowed in here. There are only two rooms that uh, uh, where food and drinks uh, are uh, are permitted all, all, all the rest is about uh, the good stuff, food and drink. Uh, and uh, Rabbi David Mivasar has offered to host a Shabbat dinner tomorrow. And if you'd like to uh, come to that uh, during the, the dinner time set, instructions will be posted uh, tomorrow and we'll say more about that uh, tomorrow. So consider that in your plans. And the reception tonight is hosted by the Canada Palestine Association on the whole thing, and we're really, really grateful uh, to them. One of the, the restaurant that is doing uh, a bit of the catering tonight and most of the catering, uh, providing our lunches over the next two days, is Tamam Restaurant. They have had a serious problem with the Israeli government and the Canadian government. Uh, uh, they are uh, the uh, People, uh, Tamam is uh, uh, at risk of losing her, or has lost now, her Jerusalem residency, she's Palestinian, and there are uh, 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 photocopies of an article about that and a way to, um, to support that in the reception room this evening. The uh, uh, start time tomorrow is 8.45, and I think we've done a good job of starting and ending uh, promptly. Uh, and so, why, um, Bishop, now that we have the grace? Please, would you stand? stand?